Um, and so now we are going to our next region, which is Polynesia. Um, and we have uh, three presenters for Polynesia. And uh, I hope they all know that they have a small section each. Um, and I will try my best to keep us on time. After Polynesia, we'll take a 15 minute break. Then I'll come back and do my dance. Right okay. So I'm gonna turn the okay. time over now to our studio. Oh, we got someone in our studio. Oh, thank you, Pumaikai. It is now your turn. Oh, mahalo, Melissa. Aloha, my karko, vau, Pumaikai. Vilina, my name. Aloha. Yes, we're here in Utah, and I'm Pumaikai. Um, part of the Hawaiian community here. I'm just going to give you f just five points about Hawaii because pretty much everyone's been there or has visited or has some kind of connections to Hawaii. Um, first one is in 1778 with the arrival of Captain Cook and of course he and his crew were the first to witness the vibrant culture that we had in the islands. Uh, the next point is the Great Mahele. Yeah, with the Kamehameha dynasty and the land divisions that happened in 1848 to 1893. Um, after that, with statehood, or from 1893 to 1941, the annexation and of course the coming of World War II. Um, annexation secured the secure, uh, sugar industry in Hawaii. Um, secured the sugar industry for the mainland uh, markets and plantations. In 1941, Hawaii was put into the mix of World War II with the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And in 1959, of course, statehood with the annexation. And um, in the early 60s brought the advent uh, of jet travel and all these things that we are, are um, well, aware, well aware of today. And those are just little things about Hawaii. Um, pretty much everybody knows um, culture through dance, through hula, through uh, its arts and crafts, and um, in here in Utah, at the last census, we had about 6,000 Hawaiians that actually live here. Most of them reside in the Salt Lake area, but throughout the state, there's about 6,000 of us. And uh, just like um, our other cousins, we are a mix now, yeah, of Haole, Popolo, Japanese, Mexican, um, and I can witness that or vow for that vouch for that with my children um, as they now are stretching their wings and moving out. So, aloha. So, thank you, brother, so much. Um, I will now turn the time over to Alu. Alu, are you ready? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect timing. You will see that I'm sitting here at a dispensary, one of our outreach uh, hospitals in the villages and I came to bring one of our women here, a senior citizen. So what I'm doing is I'm actually taking you with me on a ride um, of the work that we do here in terms of violence prevention. So I am Faru Palito Ese Iuli. My uh, um, names would, would reflect who I am. My grandmother's name, Faalu Palito Ese, is my maiden name. Yuli is my married name. I speak to you now from American Samoa, and because I'm bringing her to the doctor, we will be going in pretty soon. But here's what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to, first of all, um, ask a favor. During the break, I heard a song, and I was at home at the time, called Breathe, Let It Go, and Let It Be. So, Susie, anybody there that is able to drum up that song for me. I would love that song to continue the work that I'm doing, that we're doing here collectively on island. Breathe, let it go, and let it be. So that's my request before I forget. And then secondly, I want to say, um, bring greetings from here to you, um, Melissa, Baftai, um, for this opportunity. Great to see you again. And to all of those that are online now that I haven't had a chance to hug, or say hello to Sister Cynthia, um, Hafadeh, Dalofa, um, of course, Susie, see me. We've, we've been in this work for such a long time, and my heart um, is very grateful that um, as I speak to you from American Samoa, the work 
doesn't really change. If you're working there in violence prevention around the nation and working here on island, I am just so grateful that we've had this opportunity to uh, connect. So to low, to low, to low lover. Um, and I uh, wanted to um, invite some of the other Samoans that are here. I miss it for you, uh, Robert, Brother Robert, if you're still on, he's here with me in Samoa, so I'd like to invite him as well. To, to yeah, I'm on, I'm on, sorry. Oh, you're my love of life. Brother, you may have to take over when I take uh, old lady Alofa in to see the doctor because she doesn't speak Samoan. And often that's where I'll start from when Molly Robert and you take over. Robert um, taught me something um, way back when we began working here in Samoa. And that is, he said that with culture, the principles remain, but the practices change. Is that right, Robert? Yes. Uh, yes, yes, I think yes. so. <laughs> right, yes, you did, you did. You say that at every workshop that we have here on island. So that's what I wanted to do finally was to invite those of you that are of Samoan descent to please share as well. I'm grateful to my sister Cynthia for the beautiful PowerPoint and she's pretty much said everything. When we, when we go to conferences as executive directors for the coalitions in the past, 10 years of, as we've been developing this, she she would normally go first because she's such an eloquent speaker. She's got all the facts and she's got all the data and she just speaks for most of us in terms of the, um, the obstacles, I guess, that we, uh, that we experience within Micronesia um, and Polynesia, the, the, the groups that are speaking today. So that work is done. I don't need to go into it any more than that. But I did want to speak um, and share about um, our culture and our culture within our religious practices and the cultures within our cultures, given that we were given such a wonderful presentation this morning by Saini, by Saini of what culture is, and that is that it is a dynamic process. It's constantly changing, like Robert would say, the practices change but the principles remain the same. Those of respect, those of love, those of loyalty. And yet I'm gonna be a little bit more uncomfortable today and go into these as obstacles to being able to break the silence that we've been talking about, the sisters from Fiji, we're talking about this, this, this silence that, what I call the silence that perpetuates the violence and why that is. So when you think about the superpowers, superpowers, um, the, um, the economic, the trade, and the religious powers that swept through our regions, then that sets the, the tone and the basis also of our religious and our cultural practices and the upheavals that we've, we've gone through. And I've found that these are often some of the, uh, we, we rarely talk about them, but these, these are actually what permeates the silence within our villages, within our families, because we're forever trying to protect our name, um, our village, because that's, you know, when, when you meet an islander or Samoan, you know, where are you from? You're from the Bolu, a neighboring independent Samoa or American Samoa. We too, we too um, are one people under two flags, as my sister um, Cynthia has said. So the, the, I just wanted to affirm also that those uh, uh, kind of structures that kind of prevent us from um, sharing and having this culture of, of dialogue um, and these practices that we spoke about this morning about um, being able to empathize, being able to ask questions, um, you know, being the, the ear that was given this morning, that was quite prevalent. I noticed that the, being able to communicate doesn't come easy for us because of that. We were, within our culture, we're not taught to speak back. We're not taught to think independently. We're not taught to be critical in our um, thinking and in our sharing. We're taught respect, obedience, loyalty. So we're in there are we then able to express ourselves openly and freely? So um, that takes me into the cultural, 
cultural and religious practices that we have on island also that tend to, and, and Robert will um, speak to that also, that there is, when we're not really meant to be able to practice these kind of dialogues, when we've been given these um, cultural practices um, to, to begin considering it becomes very difficult because it actually goes against the grain of what we've been raised in, which is that of respect, like I said, humility, going to church. Um, so that the culture and religion within our Samoan community, and I'll speak within our Samoan community because um, that's what I know best, is that the very elements of our culture that appear from the outside in to be very noble and, and very um, unique are also the very um, uh, blankets, I guess, for lack of a better word, since I'm speaking in English, but I'm thinking in Samoan. They are the blankets that, that do not allow us um, to talk about equity, you know, to talk about um, not being silent anymore. Um, so, so to me, these are really not cultural practices. It's it's very unsamoan to do what Robert and I are doing here to actually set up some spaces, some safe spaces, to be able to share and to be able to talk. Because in a conference that I went to some while back, there was a speaker, a male speaker, that spoke about male privilege and that privilege is blind to those who have it. Privilege is blind to those who have it. And so that kind of pretty much permeates here on the island as well. And when we leave our islands and they are there in Utah, California, wherever our people are, we take these with us, if that kind of makes any sense. So within our own now, finally, with within our own cultures, we spoke about culture, we've spoken about the, the intersections between culture and, and religion, um, and the fact that all of these kind of work into each other with the, the, the economy, the trade, the religious, the political powers that be, they're all part and parcel of creating even more um, cultures within our own cultures. Um, and I can expand on that at, at another time. But I actually want to stop there because in, in, uh, in honor of the time, and, and I think I'm doing a pretty good job because I think I might just be able to get in to see the doctor for for her and for me, who I also have to see the doctor. I didn't want to miss this out. I didn't want to cancel it. So I'm so grateful that my brother Robert is here. I wouldn't want Robert to carry on. I think that's really what I wanted to, to talk about is um, those elements or those blankets that prevent us from breaking the silence, which is, you know, what we're talking about. It's the silence that perpetuates the violence within our Samoan community and no doubt within our Pacific region. So I'm handing it over, but I am here. I won't go without saying goodbye or when I go in to see the doctor. Okay, how's that? Thank you, Alu. <laughs> uh, please take care of yourself. This is probably the most interactive panelist I've ever had <laughs> who's actually in the service on the conference. So <laughs> Alu Fotele, it's so you. good to see you, Alu. I'm here, um, I'm here. Thank you. And I think, Robert, she wanted you just to share a little bit more in terms of the work in Samoa and uh, what you folks are doing there. Okay, and yeah, the thank you. Over to, uh, sorry, and then I'll turn the time over to Dr. Lanita Holo. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry, I, I was caught off guard. I was, I was just uh, planning to be a participant, not a... Uh, not a presenter, you, know, you, know how the, you know how our people <laughs> do it, man. It's surprise, you're on. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. I guess just to, um, you know, just, just to, to try to keep up with some of the themes that, um, you know, great job with everybody who has presented um, and just try to relate it to what we're doing here um, and also to what Alu had mentioned. Um, but yeah, one, one of the things that, um, you know, I, 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 grew up in, I grew up in Hawaii. Um, my uh, parents are from, you know, from American Samoa. My grandparents are from Western Samoa. Um, I grew up in Hawaii. I went to high school in, in Utah, graduated from Timview High School, 
Um, I, uh, I served the uh, church mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Costa Rica. Um, went back to Utah, finished my, uh, my schooling at BYU. And then I, uh, my wife and I moved back here to American Samoa in 2006. Um, and so the, the reason why I mentioned my experiences in this, these various places is that, um, you know, one of the things that I, I, I've learned about the different various places that there are certain principles that permeate throughout all the different settings that I've been in. Um, and, and I've tried to learn these principles, either principles of human relationships, um, you know, and principles of, um, of just working together. Um, but, but the, so that's one of the things that why I, I'm very, um, you know, I, I may not be able to relate with everybody on experiences, but I know that there are certain principles that, that if I stick to, I'll be able to interact and work and help, help, uh, individuals just because it's being human beings, right? That's one thing that we all, all, um, can connect with as, as far as human beings. Uh, um, and so, um, you know, Jacob had mentioned a, uh, a Samoan proverb earlier uh, where, he did, where he mentioned about the ducks, right? Uh, um, which is a proverb that means that, you know, the, the duck will fly, but will always return back to the water. And, and a lot of times people would uh, associate that proverb with, you know, somebody leaving their homeland and somebody leaving, you know, the place where they're from and always returning back to their roots. Um, but I... I I thought of it as even a little bit more deeper in that, um, you know, it talks about principles, right? That, you know, if we understand our principles, right? If we go away from our principles, you know, we, we would always, you know, we, we can always come back to the principles that come back to our foundation. Um, and then there's another, there's another Samoan proverb that states that, um, faina, I tu, I tu maufa avai, which mean that, you know, like what Alu had mentioned, that uh, practices will change, right? But principles will remain forever. Um, our culture, our culture has changed over, you know, throughout, you know, generations. Even when um, I forgot somebody was talking about being Mexican and, 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 and Catholic, right? Uh, being assumed that because he's Mexican, he's Catholic. And, and if you think about it, Catholicism is not part of the Mexican culture, right? Catholicism was introduced and they have adapted it. Same, same, same with uh, a lot of our Pacific Island cultures and Christianity. Christianity is foreign to our, our native culture, but we've learned how to adapt to those beliefs and those practices um, because we felt like it helped, it would help improve our, our quality of life, right? And, and that's kind of the message with a lot of things that we're doing here is that there may be certain practices that, um, you know, that, that we were engaged in in different times, you know, our culture was engaged in and certain practices that may be foreign um, to our culture right now. But, but if they help to improve our quality of life, if they help to improve um, uh, the relationships that we have, you know, we should embrace those. We should, uh, you know, adapt uh, those, um, those practices. You know, as, um, and, and I don't have too much time to go into the, the principles of our culture that I believe in, but, but I think that's, that's the challenge that we have um, with, with whatever setting that we're in. Because, you know, uh, again, the things that apply in the States to what Samoans are, are, are dealing with don't necessarily apply to what we're dealing with here. Um, but the principles, if we stick to the principles, it, it's, it'll be the, the, the chances of us finding the certain practices that will meet those principles will be, you know, will be a lot more successful if we focus on, on, on those things. Um, so yeah, just, that's, I think that's just what comes to mind as far as what I, you know, what I wanted to add. Thank you so. so much, Brother Robert. Um, we have just about 10 minutes left, and I'm going to transfer it. I'm trying not to rush everyone, but I want to also <laughs> keep us on time. Hello, sorry. Um, I'm now going to turn the time over to Dr. Lani Taholo, who is going to take us into the next portion of the Polynesian region um, for about 10 minutes. So thank you so much, Robert. Um, 
Thank you, um, Alu and Komai. Please don't go anywhere. We are just we're just moving to Tonga. Possibly. We're okay. we're rowing ourselves okay. to the next island. Okay. No, I'm. How do I? Oh, I can't pause. I can just mute. <laughs> so if you're joining us, can you just make sure you mute your um, phones? Um, yes. So, Doctor Tahol, are you on? I am. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> yes. Malolele and aloha and talofa. And um, I uh, am honored uh, to be here. My name is Leilani and Haakai Ko'okalani Katoa Taholo. My father is uh, Latu Inoke Katoa from Vava'u Tonga. His father was Semi Sikatoa from Vava'u Tonga Tapu, and also his mother was Anasemi Tafipo Tamoipeau. My mother is uh, Lorna Lay Martinson Katoa uh, from the Big Island of Hawaii, and she was born in Pahala and basically raised in Waihinu, a uh, Big Island. So she's a country girl. Her uh, father was um, Samuela Pele Martinson, uh, and her mother was um, Sue. Uh, it's, I want to make sure I say it correctly. It was Sue Laiwan Ako Martinson, and her great grandparents were from mainland China and came to work in the sugarcane fields of the Big Island. That's what brought them over from mainland China. So there's a mix of Hawaiian, Chinese, Norwegian on mom's side and my father's Tongan. Um, it's an honor to be here. I was asked um, uh, by Susie to speak about the strengths. And um, I also wanted to say, Melissa, I know you're on Netanis side because I grew up in San Francisco. <laughs> After we left the Bay, uh, the, Stam the Hawaii Islands, and was born there, and and we were there for a little while. But Dad, uh, as much of our population has has uh, immigrated, right back in the uh, late fifties, early sixties, uh, we moved to uh, San Francisco because Dad landed a job with Pan American, and there were many, many Tongans and many Pacific Islanders that worked for the airlines in in San Francisco airport and also LAX and and so we were all raised together with many of like Melissa's uh, Netanis side of the family so it's an honor and um, honor to be with each of you and grateful to Susie um, for doing this and helping to putting all this together and the one of the strengths that um, of course in uh, we we completed our our doctor, and I say we because my husband, Benny Simani, the Ponyua Taholo, was a part of all of my homework. He even named my dissertation, which is Kaimana, which is the, the um, it is the divine power of the wave and the sea. So uh, we call it Kaimana. One of the things that I think really stood out in the data as we were collecting all the data, the strengths of our people, uh, is the natural resilience um, to uh, connect with those parts of ourselves that feel natural. Um, let me explain a little bit. So for example, um, if you think about the low kahi wheel, right, that they teach at the Kamehameha schools. I have a cousin that speak, speaks fluent Hawaiian. They teach all the subjects in Hawaiian over there. They teach the low kahi wheel, right? So that the very top, they, they show it's a six pieces to the wheel. It's all about balance and harmony. So we believe as, as, a Pacific, as Pacific Islanders that it, how we balance our energy and our time has everything to do. It affects our, our whole being. It affects us spiritually. It affects our uh, relationships with family and friends. It affects our school and our work, our mind our thinking, it affects our emotions. There's a picture of a, of a volcano there. And my mom's from volcano lands. So they teach you that those black porous volcanic rocks have little 
pukas in them. They have the holes. So when the steam comes up, it goes, if it goes through the holes, through the pukas, it comes, goes through there, it, the, the volcano will not erupt because it's, it's the opposite of holding it in, holding it in, holding it in, like when we hold in our anger, <laughs> when we get really, you know, when we want to feel like we want to hit somebody, if we release it in healthy ways and communicate those, it is like the steam that's coming out through the little, through the holes and releasing those steams. That's the emotions and feelings. And then the last part is the physical and the body. So that's the belief. Also, the if you think about the Kaliloa that we do in our culture, the Kaliloa is where was the ancient old pillow, yeah, that they lay down on the pillow and then the parents will, will lay their arms out, stretch out their arms and they'll have their children lie in their arms and they'll whisper into their ears the do's and the don'ts. <laughs> when you go out into the village, it's okay to do this and you bring honor to the family and the name. It's not okay to do that because you're gonna bring shame to the family, you know, and you'll probably get hurt yourself. And so it's very collective, of course. But that Kali Loa is so important because when someone would act out in the village, the a lot of the, the elders would say, Oh, they didn't get the Kali Loa. <laughs> they didn't really listen to the Kali Loa from their parents or their grandparents. Um, another strength is uh, I know this sounds a little odd, but there's something about the rhythm of the way that I, I really picked up. And it's something I've known since I was born because of, we were born in Hawaii and then we were raised by our, our grandmother. It's the way that we breathe. So if you think about it, many of the Balangi that I work with here in the, you know, on the mainland, they don't realize that they breathe the way that they breathe is it breathe is very shallow for sure, especially when they're stressed. Something that's really interesting about our people is that when we breathe in the Ofa, when we breathe in the Aloha, when we breathe in the Malama, it's, it's a different kind of, it's a deep, deep breath. It's a breathing, the Ha, that, that our bodies take in and because we are from the islands and it's in our blood and it's, we've had to navigate the oceans and navigate our, our difficulties, there is something to be said about the collective breath. I've noticed that when we are together as a people um, and we connect in a way that's unspoken, but we know that it feels deep and it feels central to who we are as a people and as a culture. We breathe as one. It affects the way we breathe. And I notice that when we're connected and we feel that connection just because of who we are, we all of a sudden, we automatically breathe deeper and longer. And it allows us to get through the things that we have to get through because our people are so determined to whatever they put their their heart and their mind to you can't stop you can't stop our people and especially when it comes to how they they love their family that nothing will stop them they'll drop dead that's why we have one of the highest numbers that was also in the data one of the highest numbers the emergency room Sorry to say, uh, because we wait until the last minute. Yeah. So that's something that we're working on. But it's important for us to realize these great strengths that is already built in into who we are. Uh, some of the trauma, I think Susie was asking, you know, like some of the trauma that uh, I've noticed, like in some of the, the studies that we've done. Uh, we actually in, uh, let's see, it was... Uh, the very, very end of January in 2018, we were just, we were collecting our data. We actually were able to have a direct connection and call with a, a, a gal in Tahiti. She was right there in Papa'ete. And she was, the, the 
I thought this was so interesting because I, I was definitely thinking about the colonization, right, of like all of our different islands. Absolutely. But I, I wanted to talk about something that our young people are going through right now, this, uh, this other type of drama. Uh, and it's, I don't, I, my prayer is that it doesn't become you know, something that we pass on to our generations, but that we'll pay attention to it and help our younger people to understand what's happening. It was that um, on Wednesday night, she said that the youth would gather in the central part right there on the island, right there in, in Tahiti in town. Wednesday nights, they come together because that's when they all fight. They will put on a fighting show and they will film the fights and then they will post it on the internet. These are all our own kids, right? They will post it on the internet and what they will do is they'll have a competition on who has the best fight out of all the ones that were posted on the internet. And I, you know, I, my jaw drops, you know, and I said, so this is happening every Wednesday night? She said, yes, Lonnie. This is happening every Wednesday night here in our village on Wednesday nights. And they and, and she said, you know, I took my son to one of the most beautiful beaches here in, in our islands of Tahiti. And, you know, he pulled out his phone and he started going through his Facebook. And I told him to put that phone away right now. I wanted him to really un understand that I'm showing him the love and the beauty of our of our islands um, and I want him to be connected to that. And um, she said right now, the, uh, the majority of many of the deaths of the young people is, is suicide right now. So our um, Kanmana study was on uh, violence and suicide among our, our people. And so uh, if you go to Google Scholar and you type in Kaimana, K-A-I-M-A-N-A, -A -A. Uh, you'll see our, we're, we're there. Um, uh, we also uh, have a model that we created called appeasement and avoidance because a big section of our dissertation from all the data that came out was about shame and how our people experience shame. And uh, interestingly enough, there seems to be a piece where um, in our brains between <laughs> <laughs> where we have the emotional part of our brain and then we have the, the frontal lobe part of our brain that's more the thinking. And what tends to shut off is that our thinking when we start to feel shame. And then we go into typically two modes. We typically either try to appease our families to the point of where we tend to lose our own voices at times, just like what the other sister was saying earlier, or we tend to avoid we may not go to the funerals anymore. We may not go to the weddings anymore. But there tends to be this appeasement or avoidance where it's at the expense of our own truth and our own voices. And, and that's deeply cultural. And so we talk about that in the kind of study. Uh, so one of the things I offer as a tool in when we offer the Kaimana uh, groups, which we just got a grant and we applied for a second grant. So I will let you know so we can post it, um, is uh, what we call cultural value priority self-confrontation. This is where we actually ask the participants to go through phases where they will begin to confront their own learned cultural values and then the ones that they know are deeply embedded and are truly good for them and their family there's a lot of things that that um we have to think about we have to realize that uh as there are things that we want to hold on to for sure that are the deepest part of who we are especially being raised by a grandmother i i'm really familiar with what that feeling feels like but there are also pieces that we need to really ask ourselves in terms of the kids. Many of the kids are really concerned about how to do the kavenga. Like they don't know how to, you know, pay their mortgage at the same time and then also do the offering for the weddings and the funerals without going bust, right? So 
that's all the stuff that we confront and we talk about that and it, it's a process. So um, we're happy to keep in touch. Um, it's under Child, Child and Family Empowerment Foundation. Mm. And um, we're going to uh, post that under our website of Child and Family Empowerment Services. So it's connected. One is a for-profit, one is the, a non-profit. But um, that's, that's our, you can find us on our website, www.childandfamilyempowerment.com. Thank you so much, Dr. Tahalo. Can you put that sure. information in the chat? Sure, um, sure. There's also a request. Uh, if you can also put in the information about the Kaimana, please. Uh, yes. Interested in reading the dissertation. So. Sure. You. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Mahalo. Thank you so Mahalo, Apito. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome. Um, and now to complete um, our uh, region of Polynesia, um, I am now going to turn the time over to Sheena Aliasa, who also spoke yesterday in the Women Empowerment um, Summit. So we're so grateful to have her. Um, and I'm now gonna turn the time over to you, Sheena. Thank you. Thank you, it's my pleasure being here. I just want to start off with my pepeha and just a little bit of background of where I am from. Um, ko Aurangi te maunga, ko Wairarapa te Moana, ko Ngati Kahununu ki Wairarapa te Iwi, ko Kohunui te Marae, ko Teke Ato Riwai Fitzgerald taku mama, ko Hone Paddy Fitzgerald taku papa, ko Shina taku ingoa, ko Turangi Aho. I'm just sharing a little bit about my whakapapa and where I'm from, and I really appreciate those who have shared before me as they share similar things to what's happening in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So as we go forward, we certainly know that the Polynesian triangle is super related because as I hear my Tongan sister speaking, my Samoan brother and sister speaking as well, similarities across the board so we know that it's not just a, a culture in a in a island kind of concept it truly is global and now that we've shared different um ethnicities um and i heard pomai talking about how his whakapapa is extended ours has too my father was irish my mother's maori my kids are half samoan how do we fit in we live in utah I've been, um, I've been very fortunate, very blessed to have lived in several countries, to tour, to um, visit several countries, but knowing that we've all got similarities in some way has been a comforting kind of um, aspect. And when we look at culture and diversity, um, I think that's why I got into education, was because I didn't believe that I could do anything. I didn't believe I was going to surmount to anything. But I had my mother who believed in me that I could. She believed in me far more than I probably believed in myself. And as in my journey, as I worked with um, at-risk kids in Hawaii as the principal for Heia, King, Castle, and Kamehameha, um, we all had similarities. And it was always looking at our kids, looking for the identity. Who am I? Why am I here? How does this connect to that? And where do I fit in this piece of my puzzle? So as I go through education, I think it's profoundly important that as we look at the diversity and the beauty of being here in Utah, is that I can be Māori. I look fair as, white as, and I'm Māori. And then there was a discussion even at Kapalama campus when I was the principal there, is that how Hawaiian are you? To me, my cause in education is to educate our kids and their families that it doesn't matter how much you are, is that if you identify, identify to it, you are. You could have just a little bit of Māori in you. If you can call back your whakapapa and know how you're related, you are. So Hawaiians, they've got a real strong connection. And being at um, Kamehameha campus, it just opened my mind even more so as to how Hawaiians are um, 
doing the same as us, how we're learning the language and the resurgence of knowing and understanding your culture has been really important. Now I go back home and I look at all my nephews and nieces and they're all te reo speakers, they're fluent te reo speakers that skipped my generation. Does that make me any less of a Māori? No, I am who I am because of who I am. I speak to my brother, Seamus, who is extremely knowledgeable in the Māori tanga, so much so that scholars kind of refer to him and he's been um, a blessing, I would say, not only in Hawaii, but for Polynesian Culture Centre to be able to center it around who we are as people. There's a song and I love the song. I'm not going to sing it because you'll hear I'll hurt your ears, but it goes, ko taku reo, taku oho oho, ko taku reo, taku mapihi. That's my language is awakening and my language is the window to my soul. Now, when we speak our language, and like I said, I am not te reo speaker. I wish I was. It doesn't lessen me as a Māori any more than it does someone who's very fluent. However, they have the knowledge of one word that fits into all the Pākehā words, and that seems like, okay, I say this Māori word, but it could mean so many different variations of that word in Māori, in, in English. So vice versa, but the island language, no matter what language you speak, has a richness in one word, where in the Pākehā language, we've got to find five, six different words to match that one word. So what I'm finding too is in education is that if we don't teach our kids identity, if we don't teach our kids who we are as people, who you are, where are you descending from, our kids are going to get lost in that mix somewhere. In New Zealand, there was a lot of gangs. Now, I came from a little town called Turangi that had about 3,000 people. We had three, three prisons full three of them, and we had about two churches. One was the Mormon, one was the Catholic church. And so when people came in, it was more about their culture of learning coming in and influencing another. So the reason why I say that is because I could have influenced, been easily influenced to go to the drinking gang route. But I wasn't. My core and my identity was a lot stronger because of my foundation of where I was raised, on the marae, with my grandparents, with my aunties and uncles, who I consider as my mum and dad too. So that's how we were all raised. How do we transpose that to here in Utah? Well, I've been a very, um, I think very fortunate to have had those experiences, but end up at Pacific Heritage Academy, where I can influence our little keiki, our little tamariki, to be able to understand who they are. Our theme or our motto is Mighty Voyages because we all come from somewhere. We all stand on our own two feet and we all stand proud in our foundation. But it's also knowing and understanding each other so we can live in harmony. That's what I'm really excited about my, my, um, he, um, my journey here in Utah is that I've come from Aotearoa, I've come from Hawaii, loved my experiences, grew from my experiences, and now being in Utah for the last two years, I've embraced the Utah way, but also knowing and understanding that our kids are important, they're number one, so education is my passion, but teaching them who they are is even more passionate. So I know in interest of time, I didn't want to go over the 245 mark, but I do know that the influence of foundation, family, your core values, the influence of your church, your society, the influence of your friends dictates as to how you're going to be. There is research that by third grade, you can tell whether a child's going to choose whether they're going to jail or whether they're going to be an upstanding citizen or com that contributes to society. If we're looking at our little babies in that area, if we're teaching them from home who are their first parents, that's where we need to start from. So your work 
our work in education from K through 12 and up into 21 is extremely important so they're not stuck to their phones. I heard um, our tall and sister talking about, yeah, your kids are stuck to the phones. Same, five-year-olds and up, two-year-olds not knowing how to turn a page because they know how to swipe a, swipe a iPad. How do we make sure that they keep up with today's no, um, educational know-how, but know the fundamentals of who people are and not lose sight of communication? So that's what I have to share with you, and I appreciate this. Any, any chance anybody needs to get their story out, you need to. It's not your job, nor your kuleana, to keep it. It's our job to share it so that somebody else can learn either from your mistakes, your errors, or to learn how to be confident and strong. And um, what's the word when you're a risk taker and you do it? And don't be ashamed of what somebody else is going to say. You do it. So anyway, I'll leave that with you. Kia ora. Um, if you've got any questions, then love it. And anything I can do, please feel free to reach out.